Greg. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Me Plus Plus seminar. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Greg McCall with us today from the University of South Florida. And Greg will talk about voltage graphs and way realizations. Over to you, Greg, please. Okay, well, thank you for uh, coming to this talk. In my case, this morning, in the case of some of you, uh, this afternoon, I, perhaps evening for some of you, I don't, um, I decided that the best thing to talk about was a device that is being increasingly used for investigating crystal structures. And there's been a recent rather dramatic upgrade. And the good thing about this upgrade is that you can do all kinds of things. You can handle practically any crystal with it. The bad part of it is that it is icky. Um, so I thought I would give a presentation about what it's all about and some of the basic references, and then uh, you can decide what you want to do about it, if anything. But first, I owe an apology for people who uh, came on May 7th, and um, I was not there. And uh, the reason was because um, I misread what the time difference was between Liverpool and here. So I apologize profusely. And uh, now let's go on to the talk. So voltage graphs are ultimately about graphs. And so just a few words about graphs. Um, my impression talking to material science people is that using graphs as representing materials is both good and bad. Uh, you have, I was introduced to crystallography by people working on MOFs. So we had molecular building blocks with ligands. And so those can be readily represented by graphs. Uh, there are also structures in which you actually have individual atoms with covalent bonds. Uh, assuming you actually believe in covalent bonds, I've been told by physicists that covalent bonds are a complete literary device invented by a science fiction writer by the name of Linus Pauli. But uh, if there's no physicist presence, uh, we can pre pretend that there's such a thing as covalent bonds. But there's no way around this. Ionic crystals representing these with graphs uh, present certain um, nomenclature problems, which we are going to avoid in this talk. But um, graphs are two-dimensional, but there are ways to capture three-dimensional structures in graphs. And that is sort of where we are heading today. We are after three-dimensional representations of uh, materials represented at the molecular or atomic level. OK, one thing about graphs that we should remind ourselves about is graph isomorphism. So a graph isomorphism is a bijection from a graph to graph that associates, gives a one-to-one -one correspondence between vertices and uh, between edges and preserves the incidence relation. So for instance, these two are isomorphic because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the vertices and between the edges, but that is not true for this one. Some chemical properties are captured at least partially by um, isomorphism classes. If two uh, structures are isomorphic, then they have certain similar uh, chemical or material properties, but other properties are not. At any rate, it's an invariant, and it's a complete invariant. And so um, when you're dealing with graphs, uh, this is actually one of the major ways for classifying crystal structures. Greg, could you clarify uh, the concept of an invariant? Uh, did you mean the graph isomorphism class? Graph yeah. isomorphism class. So you have you, uh, the graph isomorphism creates an equivalent class between graphs. Two graphs are equivalent if there's an isomorphism from one to the other. And every single graph will be in its own graph isomorphism class. So in that sense, it is an invariant. And you will find crystal databases, such as the reticular um, 
uh, RCSR, reticular chemical structure or resource, uh, classify structures by crystal structures by graph isomorphism. So um, the, there are downsides to graph isomorphism, which I will not get to in this talk. Okay, so voltage graphs. Uh, the the basic problem with talking about uh, graphs classified by graph graph isomorphism is that crystals have infinite graphs. So what do you do about that? You look at you no, know, uh, some kind of finite package representing that graph. So here's a graph. And uh, one thing I should say is that we're actually dealing with digraphs. That is, every single edge is oriented, so it has initial vertex and terminal vertex. Uh, the combinatorial uh, graph theorists, hoop theorists, have decided to call these things graphs. And uh, by wielding the, their deep state influence, they have managed to get everyone else to refer to these things as graphs. At any rate, uh, this then is what combinatorial group theorists call a graph. Every single edge has an initial vertex and a terminal vertex. And now uh, an automorphism is an isomorphism from a graph to itself. And today we're interested in isomorphisms that preserve the orientation. So this, um, this edge right here is mapped by an R automorphism to this edge right here, mapping its initial vertex to its initial vertex, terminal vertex to terminal vertex. The automorphism of the group of this thing you may notice is the cyclic group of order five, and it partitions the edges into different orbits. Two green edges are in the same orbit. That means that there is an automorphism that maps this green edge to this green edge, but there is no automorphism that maps this green edge to this blue edge. So uh, that's so this green edge to this um, yellow edge. Those there's no such automorphism that does that. So um, we we can partition all of the the vertices into uh, orbits and the edges into orbits, and then we can create a quotient graph. The vertices of the quotient graph are the vertex orbits. All of the red vertices are collapsed into a single red orbit. All of the um, blue vertices, I seem to be missing some vertices, are then um, mapped to this blue orbit and all of the brown ones to this brown orbit. So that's how you get a quotient graph. <clears throat> and now we're interested in using the quotient graph to reclaim the original graph. The quotient graph is going to be our finite package that represents the entire graph. So what we want to do is we want to figure out how to get the original graph from the quotient graph. Well, the topologists have done something like that about a century ago. You take this quotient graph and you lift it to a subgraph of the original graph. This lifted graph will have interior edges, will have a bunch of edges, one for each orbit, and interior vertices, one for each orbit, and possibly some extra vertices as well. And this thing is called a lift. Uh, the topologists vary in whether or not to call the graph the lift or the map uh, C the lift, but the idea is that you are lifting the quotient up back into the original graph. And uh, the thing is that we want to focus on the interior vertices and the edges because those intersect each orbit exactly once, just as there's exactly one edge for each edge orbit in the quotient and one vertex for each vertex edge in the quotient. So what we do is we say uh, these in these edges and the interior vertices are mapped to a copy of the lift graph inside of the original graph. And then if we apply the group to uh, this quote unquote transversal, we get a green transversal. 
Apply the group again, we get a blue transversal. Apply it again, we get a red transversal. Apply it again, and we get an orange transversal. So we just we just keep going around, and we we get a tiling of the original graph by transversal. By tiling, I means every single edge and every single vertex is in exactly one transversal. So it tiles the original graph. So the next step is to say, well, if I'm going to map the black transversal to the next transversal, let's say that the next one is the red one, I want to uh, rotate uh, this one here to get to G inverse, maps this to this. So I, I'm going, I, did I do this backwards? Um, I go up G, that goes from G to uh, this vertex here goes to the next one, that's one, this one here, and G inverse, that goes from this one to this one here. And it's G inverse because this edge is actually oriented in this direction, and we're trying to go from here to here. So uh, the these... Uh, uh, labels tell you which ele group elements map which uh, map the transversal to its next transversals. And then what we do is we use this map mu to map these group elements to the quotient graph. And so we call these labels down here the voltages on the quotient graph. And the result is a voltage graph. This is the voltage graph that we can use to unpack the original graph. So um, uh, what happens is we have this reference vertex, reference transversal, and we have the volt, this is actually lifted from the quotient. And then we have these voltages that move the transversal to, to transversal, to transversal, and transversal going all the way around. Greg, could, could you clarify the notations, uh, please? Right. So G here is an element of a group, right? G is an automorphism. Right. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Uh, and zero, I, I, is it? Zero is the identity element in the automorphism. Uh -huh. So the identity automorphism. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so this is uh, it maps, notation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it maps it maps something a vertex in a transversal to a vertex in the same transversal. So it maps the transversal to itself. All of these group elements are automorphisms that map a transversal to the transversal. So these, since it's supposed to map this transversal to itself, this is the identity element. Mm -hmm. Okay, so G inverse is the inverse. Um, isomer G inverse, yeah, G, yeah, these, the elements in, in C5 mm -hmm. are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this, if, if this was 1, this would be 4. Uh, okay, so in this particular group, um, C5. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And delta, uh, what's the meaning of delta? Uh, Eta, you mean C? No, no, delta. So Greek letter delta, the triangle. Oh, yes, this is the quotient. Ah, so, that's the quotient oh. graph. Uh, and the index, uh, so V delta, so it's simply a symbol. Yeah, um, yeah, I got in the habit of referring to quotients as delta and the original graph as gamma. Okay. And E, capital E. And E is uh, is an edge. Choose an edge. And gamma of E oh. is the voltage applied to this edge. So if you have this edge in the quotient graph, and okay. your gamma of that edge will be this element G. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so capital E is a set of edges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay.
Now, there's a problem. This is the voltage graphs that were devised by Gross and Tucker about um, uh, four decades ago. And the thing is that you can you get voltage graphs from which you can obtain the original graph if and only if the group of automorphisms acts freely on the original graph. And the problem is that most crystallographic groups do not act freely on the graphs that, uh, at least the graphs that people are interested in. Uh, so that if you're playing around with a uh, periodic graph and you have a crystallographic group that does not act freely on that periodic graph, uh, you cannot use Gross and Tucker's voltage graphs to, uh, to package the thing. So um, there was a way around it. Um, and that is, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. It does contain all the information you need to construct the original graph if you're using a group that acts freely on that graph, such as a lattice group. So if you started off with a graph and a voltage assignment, and then you could, this would be the derived graph. And this is in fact the approach that the topologists uh, tend to take. Uh, and that includes the topological graph theory people. They simply start off with a graph, they plop a voltage assignment, and they say, let's take a look at what we get. Uh, this may be an approach of a, that appeals to the um, crystal design people. So the vertex set of, these, of this derived graph is just going to be the vertices in this alleged quotient graph and the group of automorphisms. The edge set is going to be the edges, uh, across the group of automorphisms. And then for every single one of those edges, you can you get a formula for finding its initial endpoint and its terminal endpoint. So this is the way that the Kamatoris and topologists have been getting voltage graphs. Okay, so for instance, uh, C maps this lift, and what you get is all of these, um, these are the different lifts that make up this graph. And each one of these points then is going to be this ordered pair of this particular vertex, that's this particular vertex here, comma, uh, the, um, the group, uh, G of the group. So um, the, there is a problem. And the question is, what do you actually get if you do it this way? So let's, let's do what the commentators see. I'm going to assign from a group, this is the integers. And so let's play around with the freeze. This thing is a is a perfectly good voltage graph. I've assigned a voltage from the integers to every single edge, and I am going to unpack it. And what I wind up with is this, three of these things. I don't want three of these things, I want a single freeze. So what, this is something that goes all the way back to Gross and Tucker. What they did is they found a spanning tree of the quotient graph, and then they shifted all the voltages so that every single voltage in the spanning tree was zero, so that this spanning tree would be within a single transversal. And then they carried out the um, derived graph operation, and they got a single freeze. So the thing is that you can have, quote unquote, equivalent voltages assigned to the quotient graph, and you'll get different derived graphs. The different derived graphs will only vary in the number of components they have. Every single one of those components will be isomorphic to each other. And there is a way to set up the voltages so you get only a single component. Anyway, this is, this is the situation that crystallographers face. This is how you get the a freeze. And so uh, there was a paper that appeared several decade, a decade or so afterwards by Chung and some friends that said, well, what we do is we start off with a unit cell of a, of a graph, uh, 
of a crystal structure. We make a voltage graph out of that, and that voltage graph will represent the entire crystal. So once you have the unit cell, and remember the lattice group acts freely on the crystal structure, so you can make a voltage graph out of it. And so you have, all you need is a voltage graph applied to, uh, voltages applied to the unit cell, and you have a representation of the crystal structure. Okay, uh, but there are some things that we actually want in addition. Uh, we want, a geometric graph. We want the graph to actually be embedded in space so that it will tell us where the individual atoms and individual molecular building blocks are. So it's not just a combinatorial or topological graph. We want something that's embedded in space. And also, we want to be able to deal with any crystallographic group, not just a Bieberbach group. So let's address these desiderata once at a time. So the first one is that we want the vertices to be distinct points in space. So here is a graph. This is something that is called the Kagome dual. It's the dual of the Kagome graph. And we want to realize it. Realization of a graph is embedding it in space, preferably by in a way that its automorphisms become symmetries. Uh, this is not always possible, but uh, today I'm going to be dealing graphs in which this happens. Now, when I say I realize it, that means that I want every single vertex to be at a specific point. So this one vertex is going to be at the origin. This vertex is going to be at one zero. This one's going to be square one half square root of three over two. So um, if I embed it into space, this is a geometric object. And now I would like to have, as instead of a group of automorphisms, I want a group of symmetries. And uh, what Chung and uh, their friends did, and this has actually happened pretty quickly af uh, after uh, voltage graphs came out. They said, well, we're taking a unit cell and that's we're gonna make a voltage graph out of that. And here's, here's what they did. They made a, um, uh, they said, well, you're within a single uh, transversal, so I want all the interior edges to be zero. And then I have these uh, labeled the uh, other edges that go outwards and have non-zero voltages. These actually map from transversals to transversals. So for instance, this edge right here, this is labeled with zero comma two. That is because you are mapping a transversal whose middle vertex is right here to a, ver a transversal whose middle vertex is up here. This is the edge that's labeled, but it's labeled with the, vert with the ver voltage that maps this entire transversal to this entire transversal. And these, the, I'm having all of the edges go oriented to the right and upwards. So this edge right here is actually the inverse of this edge right here, which is actually uh, this edge right here only backwards. So these are the voltage graphs that Chung and friends came up with. Uh, for taking a unit cell and unpacking it to a graph. Greg, could, could I clarify <clears throat> the notations? Yeah. So these numbers, for example, 0, 2 on that purple edge. So this 0, that's a, 2... That's uh, a translation. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a translation. So it's a vector uh, written in a fixed basis. In the, sta in, uh, the standard basis. By standard, I mean standard orthonormal basis in the standard plane. orthonormal basis. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I, I, yeah, I did not uh, switch to um, the hexagonal basis. Uh -huh. So all um, voltage graphs here are considered uh, with respect to that standard orthonormal basis. Yeah. Well, you have to if you have something hexagonal, you have to switch a hexagonal basis if you're going to play around with the lattices. But um, I'm not going to play around with the lattices today. So I'm sticking to the orthonormal basis. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, so yes. we go from uh, from this periodic graph to a finite voltage graph, <clears throat> which is an oriented graph with labels on edges. This is uh, I have mm -hmm. this graph here. I can go to this graph down here, and the labels are in edges, but the labels are group elements that map this entire uh, transversal to another entire transversal. Okay, so, uh, so this is the definition of the voltage graph of a periodic graph. This is the periodic graph. Yeah. This is the voltage graph. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so there's one problem with this voltage graph, and that is it doesn't tell you where to put the individual vertices with respect to each other, because these are the interior edges are labeled zero. That doesn't tell us where to put the vertices. So what I want to do is I want to say, I want to label the edges with the particular vector that will map this vertex to this vertex and this vertex to this vertex. That way, this edge isn't going to be, it's just going to be one zero. And this edge will just be one half square root of three over two. So this tells you where to put the vertices. And then I want to have this as a voltage graph. But that creates a problem. When I do that, I wound up with several different components stacked on top of each other because, of course, these are realizations of graphs. So I have several, several different components stacked on top of each other, and the whole thing looks sort of like HXL, which is not the Kagome dual. So what do I do? I want to reconstruct the original graph. I want one component of the derived graph. So what I do is I choose a vertex in my quotient graph, let's say the middle one, and I say, I'm going to start from here. I'm going to call this, this thing over here is this vertex over here in the voltage graph, the middle vertex, I'm going to call the base vertex. And this vertex over here, I'm going to call the reference vertex. And then I simply follow the voltages to generate all of the incident edges to the reference vertex and the adjacent vertices to the reference vertex. You'll notice that some of the vertices are in the same, are in the same orbit, uh, same transversal as the reference vertex, while others are not. And then I follow the voltages again, or rather the appropriate uh, conjugates of those voltages to generate their incident edges. And then at the end of those other ends of those incident edges, I get their uh, adjacent vertices, and I just keep on going forever. And after an infinite amount of time, I get the original derived graph back again. So this is how to get a single component of the um, of the of the derived graph from the voltage graph. And usually, since you want something connected, this is actually what you're after. OK. Uh, the thing is that you can have a huge number of components of the derived graph. Um, actually, derived graph would have had countably many components. Sorry about that. But um, at any rate, uh, what we have now is a way of generating a geometric graph from one of Gross and Tucker's uh, uh, voltage graphs. But what we would like to do is to be able to generate anything. So what we do next is we would like to generate a graph. And this means that we have to do something that's different. You'll notice that because the automorphism group, or later the symmetry group, on the graph we were dealing with, um, it acted freely. And that means that with respect to that group, the stabilizers of the vertices and the stabilizers of the edges were all trivial. But the overwhelming majority of crystal structures we're interested in will have graph representations where vertices and sometimes even edges have non-trivial stabilizers. 
So we need to have a more general notion of a voltage graph. And that is what we're going to do next. So here is a generalization of voltage graphs that appeared three years ago. So here is the Kagome dual again. And the Kagome dual has two orbits of vertices and one orbit of edges. So I have labeled one orbit the red vertices, another orbit the blue vertices, and all of the edges are black. And this is the symmetry group P6MM. And the thing is, is that the Kagome, verde, um, Kagome dual is nice in the sense that its automorphism group can be entirely realized by symmetry. So the symmetry group and the automorphism group are equivalent. OK, now we're after the quotient graph. Uh, under the symmetry group, the quotient graph, we're going to map all of the blue vertices to a blue orbit, all of the red vertices to a red orbit, and all of the edges to a single edge that goes from a blue orbit to the red orbit. So you're supposed to pretend that every single ver every single edge is oriented from a blue vertex to a red vertex. Now we want to follow the procedure in um, uh, we want to follow the procedure in Gross and Tucker by assigning a uh, isometry that maps a blue vertex to a red vertex. And what we're going, I'm going to do is I'm going to plop in a, um, a translation. So the translation is going to be minus a half square root of three over two, again, with respect to the orthonormal basis. But the thing is, is that all of these vertices have non-trivial stabilizers. So the question is, what are you going to do about those stabilizers? There is a temptation to say, well, let's use the entire stabilizer. Uh, but that leads to certain te technical difficulties, which I am not going to discuss today. There are lots of technical difficulties in the Potashnik and Toledo uh, construction. So what I'm going to want to do is I want to assign to each of these vertices a group that is big enough to take this edge and make all six incident edges out of it and a group that's big enough around this red vertex. And it has to be big enough to make the three edges that are incident to it. That's all that I am after. OK, so let's try our favorite groups. Group of order six, that'll do the job. It will make, create six copies, or actually five additional copies of the edge around the blue vertex. Three, two additional copies of the edge around the red vertex. Now, um, now we're going to want to unpack this, and it turns out to be a little bit more complicated. Okay. So uh, you'll notice this is one thing I, I I should point out that when I unpack it, I'm going to wind up with the it, the uh, stabilizer of the blue vertex is going to wind up being D6, while the stabilizer of the red vertex is going to be D3. So by magic, I am going to get stabilizers that are larger than the initial groups assigned here. And incidentally, Potashnik and, and Toledo decided to call these weight groups. So I'll call these weight groups. Um, but the thing is, is that the fact that we get uh, these additional symmetries is partially a result of choosing this particular vector. Okay, so the next question is, how do we derive a graph? So yeah, we assign weight groups. So, um, Greg, could I ask if this vector is very essential? What if you take the vector, say, one, zero? One, zero? If mm -hmm. I took this vector right here, mm -hmm. I would get the same thing. The, the funky thing would happen, and this is what turned up in this I am talk, mm 
suppose I took C6, uh, now C6 and C3, and I put in this vector, I put in any vector, and what I will get is this thing rotated by some amount. Mm -hmm. So this joints of weight groups, I will always get the Kagome dual possibly reoriented. So what is important? Only the length of this vector. What's, excuse or, me? Only the length of this vector is important, length one. In this particular case, uh -huh. uh, you may recall from the SIAM conference that I said, what happens if I plug in D3 here? D3 mm -hmm. will also produce six, five additional copies, but it will produce them with a different geometry and the result is something that is isomorphic to the Kagome dual, but has different symmetries. So the thing is that your choice of what weight group you're going to use is going to influence what you wind up with. Mm -hmm. Okay, so by symmetries, could I clarify, you mean a subgroup of um, Euclidean isometries? S symmetries are going to be uh, those iso isometry group that is also a symmetry of the structure. Mm -hmm. So preserving the structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, I seem to have some extra slides in here. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so here's the point. Um, I get the stabilizer of the blue vertex is D6, stabilizer of the red vertex is D, is D3. Okay, and there's a whole bunch of technicalities. When I create the derived graph, I get a whole bunch of vertices that look like this. It's of the blue vertex orbit, and then I have this coset here, G times C6. I have the red vertex and G times C3. So I have, um, and you'll notice that I have a different sets of cosets. This is one reason why in the paper, I tend to avoid the word coset because that can be confusing. Okay, so the problem, there is a problem, and that it, there are several complications. One is, um, if I have, I can have a weight group of a vertex, and then the edges have weight group, wind up with weight groups too. For instance, in this graph right here, you have uh, mirrors that run through these edges. And so th those mirrors are for reflections that are symmetries. Um, in this case, you don't have to worry about that. Let me just skip that. The, point, the thing I want to point out as a big pain is when I make the derived graph from this voltage graph, I wind up with something that has several components. And I stack them on top of each other, and it winds up looking like HXL. So once again, I don't want the derived, entire derived graph. I want just one component of the derived graph. So I generate the that component in the same way I generated uh, a component of the derived graph for the Gross and Tucker uh, graphs. I choose the blue orbit and I say, I'm gonna have a blue vertex as my reference vertex. And the I'm going to apply the, the um, translation minus one half square root of three over two to get a red vertex. Oops. Next thing I do is I apply C6 to this edge in red vertex and I generate all of the incident edges and neighboring red vertices. Then I expand, I expand uh, one of the I expand each of the red, additional red vertices to get its vertex figure. And I do that for all of them until I get another collection of blue vertices and more edges. And again, I just keep on going forever until I get the entire Kagome graph back again. And I get exactly one component of this thing. So that is how to generate this thing step by step. And um, the, it is true that this is more complicated and I have a suspicion that what most crystallographers are going to want is a way to bury the complications in the software so that they can just use it. 
So uh, this is essentially for people who are interested in the underlying theory. I think this is going to be particularly interesting to people who are interested in crystal design because these voltage graphs do provide something that resembles a blueprint for making these things. So, but at any rate, there's still these things. There's still a lot of work to be done with figuring out how to use um, these generalized voltage graphs as blueprints. At any rate, here are the uh, papers that I referenced in this um, in this talk, and the floor is now open to questions. And I finished uh, 19 minutes early. Thank you very much, Greg. Let us thank Greg for the uh, beautiful presentation, please. <clears throat> okay, yes, indeed. Um, probably I'll stop recording.